Hey everyone, Ryan here, and welcome back to our orthodontics series. So we've been talking about biomechanics, which is a fancy combination of biology and mechanics. The last video we talked about the biology of tooth movement. In this video, we will talk about the mechanical principles of tooth movement. So first we have to talk about the center of resistance. So the center of resistance is a fixed point that a force must pass through in order to move an object in a straight line. So let me show you how that works. Let's say we have a free floating object in space. The center of resistance would be coincident with the center of mass. So for this uniform square, the center of resistance is right at its center. So if we push the square from the left and the force is applied through that center of resistance, the square will translate to the right. However, if we were to push on that square, let's say down here for instance, now the square will still move to the right, but it will also spin around as it does so, because that force isn't being applied through the center of resistance. You can try this out for yourself with a pencil if you have one handy. You can put the pencil down on a flat surface and try to push it through its center of resistance. Now if you find the right spot to push on, the pencil will move straight across the table without rotating one way or the other. But if you press the pencil at either end, you'll see how it starts to spin. And that is the center of resistance at work. Now for a tooth, it's a little bit different because the tooth isn't floating in space or laying flat on a table. It's tethered to bone and soft tissue at its root. So the center of resistance for a healthy tooth is generally about halfway between the alveolar crest and the root apex. So it would put it around the center of the root. Now the center of, resist of resistance tends to be located more apically for a periodontally compromised tooth that has loss of bone at the alveolar crest and the center of resistance tends to be located more occlusally for teeth when apical root resorption has happened because there's less root surface at the bottom and the new center of the clinical crown is further up. So really in all three of these cases, the center of resistance is located at the center of the portion of root that is bound to bone. Now the center of rotation is different. So the center of rotation is an unfixed point around which an object is rotating if and when it is rotating. So another way to say it is, it's the point about which a body appears to have rotated as determined from its initial and final position. So let's go back to the pencil example. If you push the pencil let's say down here near the tip or up here near the eraser, it will tend to rotate as we talked about before. So let's say we are going to push the pencil near its eraser. And let's say the pencil will spin so that the tip stays relatively still and the rest of the pencil kind of spins around like this. So as it's rotating, the part of the pencil that stays where it is and doesn't appear to move is the center of rotation. So you can imagine that this center of rotation will change dramatically depending on where you apply the force. It is an entirely unfixed point and it's entirely dependent on where that force is being applied. So it's easy to apply force through the center of resistance for a pencil because you have access to its entire length along the pencil if it's lying down on a desk, for instance. 
But for a tooth, however, that's a completely different story because we know that the center of resistance is buried down here and a force that's applied up here at the bracket will not act through the center of resistance and will cause some kind of rotation of the tooth. So you can imagine that we will be dealing with the center of rotation quite a bit because it's very difficult to apply force through that center of resistance. Now, of course, we've been talking about forces already, but I just want to briefly revisit the basics here. So a force is a linear vector with both magnitude, some amount of strength, and direction. It's often represented by a straight arrow in uh, force diagrams. So we usually would draw the arrow pointing towards an object for a push and draw the arrow away from an object to describe a pull. And orthodontics is really just a series of push and pull force systems applied to the teeth. Now the point of force application is also crucial. So not only does a force have magnitude and direction, but it's also being applied to some specific location on the tooth, again, usually at the bracket. And like we talked about before, any force against an object, unless the force is directed through that object's center of resistance, causes a tendency to rotate, which is also called a moment. So a moment, or a moment of a force, is the tendency of a force to cause a body to rotate about a specific axis, which is the center of rotation. So a moment occurs whenever a force is delivered at some distance from the center of resistance. So the equation to calculate that is moment is equal to force times distance. So if a force is applied, uh, let's say here, again, up here by the eraser, you would multiply that force's magnitude by the distance of that application of the force to the center of resistance. So that's what the distance D is referring to. So you might notice we're really getting uh, a little bit heavy into the mathematics side of things, but this is almost identical to the equation for torque used in physics. And the equation is helpful because it helps us understand that the rotational tendency is stronger the further away the force is applied from the center of resistance. The bigger this number is, the bigger this number will be. So this is like closing a door. So you can take any door that's near you and try one time to push on that door with your hand close to the hinges. Of course, be careful not to pinch your fingers, but then try again to close that same door, this time with your hand on the handle. And notice how much easier it is the second time when you're applying that force further away from the hinge axis. And that's because you have more rotational influence. So again, just to revisit this concept, if we're straight through the center of resistance, that force is being applied straight through there, we have no moment because the distance would be equal to zero. As soon as we go outside of that, there's either going to be a counterclockwise moment or a clockwise moment that's wrapping around that center of resistance and that's representing a moment. All right, so let's keep it going. A couple refers to two parallel forces that are equal in magnitude, opposite in direction, and non-collinear, which means they do not share a line of action. In other words, they're separated by some distance. So a force couple creates pure rotation. That is a pure moment, either clockwise or counterclockwise 
which can be incredibly useful in orthodontics, as you will soon see. So the magnitude of the moment of a couple, or MC, is equal to the magnitude of one of the applied forces times the perpendicular distance between those two forces. So here is our um, force couple, one force pointing this way and an equal and opposite force pointing this way, and they are non-collinear, so they're acting at some distance from each other. So in order to have a couple, you need to have two points of contact, two separate points of contact, and a wire, an orthodontic wire, being engaged into a bracket slot often results in two points of contact, which makes that very useful to us as orthodontists. And this is why. So we can look at some examples of couples and how they help us to move teeth in the des desired directions. So in the first order, that's from an occlusal view, based on how the wire is pushing against the base of the bracket slot is applying a couple for us to rotate this tooth. So the wire is trying to get back to its original shape, and so it's pushing on the bracket slot, or the bra bracket base, I should say, at that point, and it's pulling against the, the ligature that's tying that wire to that bracket on this side of the bracket. So we're having two forces that are equal and opposite and non-collinear. So this is creating a couple to provide mesiodistal rotation. And so it wants to turn that tooth around in order to straighten out the wire. So that's an example of a first order couple. The second order is from a facial view, and it's based on how the wire is pushing down on one end of the bracket and up on the other end, creating a couple, this time for mesiodistal angulation. And lastly, for the third order, that's from a proximal or side view, and that's based on how a rectangular wire is engaged and twisted into the bracket slot so that it pushes on one end and down on the other end, creating a tiny couple, but it can be effective in order to tip this tooth, or I should say torque this tooth for improved buccolingual inclination. So these are all examples of couples and how orthodontic wires act on brackets to generate these four systems. Now don't worry if you don't understand all the details of this, I just wanted to illustrate some cool examples of these complicated mechanics to give them some clinical application because I know this stuff can get pretty tough to understand. So now we can apply all of these mechanical principles and terms to the types of tooth movement that we talked about in the last video. So the first of those is uncontrolled tipping. So the moment of couple to moment of force ratio is something that we can now use to describe each of these biomechanical movements. For this one, the ratio is equal to zero. In other words, the, mesi the moment of the couple is equal to zero, which means there's no couple here, which makes sense because couples can be hard to obtain and this is the lowest effort and easiest tooth movement that we have. So if, we, if we're using a finger spring that's pushing against a tooth from with only one point of contact, well, we're not gonna have any couple there and it's just gonna produce uncontrolled tipping. So in these diagrams that I'll have in the next couple slides, the center of resistance is shown by the red X inside the circle the center of rotation is shown by this black X. The force is shown by the straight blue arrow 
and any moment that's generated is represented by the curved blue arrows. So the center of rotation and center of resistance are almost at the same point. So the tooth rotates around a point very close to its center of resistance, but usually the center of rotation is just slightly apical to that center of the root. Now because the force is applied at some distance from that center of rotation, we have some amount of D. So there's going to be a moment that's created. So the tooth wants to rotate. So the crown will go in the direction of the force and the root will go in the opposite direction. The tooth tips uncontrollably because there is no couple to counteract this moment of a force. So there's no controlling, counteracting couple at work. The uncontrolled tipping is the result of one point of contact on the tooth crown, like again, a finger spring from a removable appliance. This is the easiest and fastest type of tooth movement, but often undesirable. For control tipping, the ratio is between zero and one. In other words, the moment of a couple is less than the moment of the force. So the center of rotation here is moved apically away from the center of resistance and is at around the root apex. So at least this time, the crown moves in the direction you want while the root stays more or less where it is instead of going back in the opposite direction. So force applied to a bracket causes translation of the tooth and some amount of rotation, while the small couple applied to the tooth counteracts and negates that rotation. So instead of this root being moved this way, like an uncontrolled tipping, it stays where it is thanks to the couple that's being applied. In this example, that would have to be a third order couple provided by a rectangular wire in an edgewise bracket. So for bodily movement, the ratio is now one. It's equal to one, which means the moment of a couple equals the moment of a force. So notice how this moment of a couple is getting stronger and stronger as we go through these tooth movements. So here, the tooth moves bodily, or translates, and the center of rotation is displaced infinitely far away from the center of resistance because there is no rotation. Ultimately, the crown and the root move together the same amount in the same direction. In order to get successful bodily movement, it requires both a force to move the crown and a fairly strong couple to prevent tipping altogether, which is why this is one of the more difficult and slower movements to achieve. And then for root torque, the ratio now is greater than one. In other words, the moment of a couple is greater than the moment of a force. So this is a unique type of tooth movement because this is the only time that the root is moving more than the crown itself. Therefore, the center of rotation is displaced in the opposite direction and moves towards the incisal edge, which this time stays relatively still. This movement is incredibly difficult to achieve and often requires some auxiliary appliances because you're trying to move a root through bone while keeping a crown steady, which is sitting in essentially air, which is a lot, it's a lot easier to move something through air than it is through bone. So it requires a very strong couple in order to successfully attain this tooth movement. Now then we have rotation where the ratio is irrelevant, it doesn't really exist because this time we don't really have a moment of a force here. The denominator is equal effectively to zero and we're making a first order couple to spin the tooth around 
its long axis. So pure rotation refers to rotation of a tooth about its long axis. So now we're looking down on the tooth from an occlusal view. And again, hypothetically, we don't have a moment of a force, which would be the denominator in the ratio. And a couple alone is applied to a tooth, causing it to rotate about its center of resistance. Here we're looking at this premolar, again from an occlusal view, and it's spinning around to straighten it out in the arch. And the center of rotation is at the center of resistance. Now here's a helpful diagram listing the names of different types of directional tooth movement. So protraction refers to forward movement, retraction, backward movement, those are your uh, bodily movements. Of course, intrusion and extrusion are also technically bodily movement because it's another, another version of pure translation. Tipping the crown forward is proclination. Tipping it backward is retroclination. And then we have labial or buccal root torque and lingual or palatal root torque. So just a nice summary slide I put together to help explain the names of some of those tooth movements. And finally, let's have a discussion about anchorage. So orthodontic anchorage is defined as resistance to unwanted tooth movement. And it's based on the idea of Newton's third law, that for every action, there is an equal and opposite reaction. In other words, for every desired tooth movement, there is an equal and opposite, potentially undesirable tooth movement. Now, a really helpful way to think about this is teeth undergoing orthodontic treatment are in a constant tug of war. So if we're trying to pull these teeth with, let's say, there's a space here and we're closing space with an elastomeric chain, we're trying to pull these teeth this direction, well, these teeth will naturally get pulled this way. So the goal of treatment is to produce more intentional desire tooth movement as opposed to unintentional, undesirable tooth movement. Now here's another reason why light force is often preferred whenever we can have it, because light force produces desired movement with little side effects. So there's less anchorage toll. In other words, there's less equal and opposite force that we have to worry about. On the contrary, really heavy force produces our desired tooth movement, sure, but it has more deleterious side effects and is more likely to put a toll on our anchorage. So just like in tug of war, the bigger and stronger participants will contribute more. And so the bigger the surface area of the combined periodontal ligaments, the more anchorage value a tooth or unit of teeth will have together, and the more they will be able to resist tooth movement. So in this example, if again, we were trying to close this premolar extraction space, and we were pitting these three anterior teeth against these three posterior teeth, which unit of teeth do you think is going to move more? So if you said the anterior unit, you were exactly right. They're getting overpowered by the overwhelming amount of PDL surface area in the posterior. And so these back teeth are going to win the tug of war. Now the same thing goes if we were trying to open the space with a coil spring, for instance. The front teeth would be pushed forward more than the back teeth would be pushed backward. Again, this unit of teeth has more surface area thanks to these multi-rooted molars, and they're not going to budge as much as this anterior unit of teeth. So one application of this is called reciprocal anchorage. We now know that forces applied to one tooth unit cause an equal and opposite reactionary force on another tooth unit. And if both units have equal anchorage values, that means that the PDL area is the same, 
then they will both experience equal and opposite tooth movement. So not only is the force equal and opposite, but so is the movement that those teeth experience. So movement of one tooth can be pitted against another exactly like it, like for diastema closure between number eight and nine here. They both have roughly similar periodontal ligament surface areas. You can also pit a group of teeth against another group of teeth, each with equal anchorage values, such as a central, lateral, and canine, and a second molar, and a second premolar, and a first molar. So it would be like in this example, except we leave out the second molar here, these two units would be roughly equal to one another. Now the way to tip the scales in one direction or the other is called reinforced anchorage. And there are several ways to reinforce our anchorage. In our tug of war analogy, I equate this to just adding more people or adding stronger people to one of the two teams. So we can do this by adding more teeth to the anchor unit. And that would distribute that equal and opposite reaction force over a larger PDL area. So the anchor unit doesn't move as much. Now we can also add extra oral sources like the back of the head, for instance. So headgear can be used to augment anchorage as well, but poor patient compliance, they don't like to wear it, and heavy intermittent forces from the headgear, if it's being taken on and off all throughout the day, are not good ways to counterbalance the light continuous force from orthodontic appliances. So those are just two examples of how we can reinforce our anchorage unit. Another way to really tip the scales is skeletal anchorage. So in our tug of war analogy, I equate this to one side basically cheating and placing metal stakes in the ground and then planting their feet behind those stakes. Now the stakes can fall out, but if not, that, te that team is not going to move at all. So our metal stakes here are called temporary anchorage devices, and TADs act like ankylosed teeth when they are successful. They are not going to budge, and so they are screwed into bone, and they are not intended to move unless they fail and fall out. So bone screws are placed in the alveolar bone, and they provide anchors for moving usually specific teeth, whereas bone plates are attached to basal bone uh, beneath the teeth by multiple bone screws, and they provide an anchor for more extensive tooth movement. So bone screws are generally less invasive, but are potentially less stable, whereas bone plates are more invasive, but can be more stable because multiple screws are being utilized. The lower limit for TAD placement is generally around age 11 when the bone is mature enough in order to uh, hold these TADs with some amount of stability. For these mini implants, this uh, concept of osseointegration that we talked about with uh, permanent implants is not necessary and perhaps not desirable because they are meant to be temporary, and we don't want them being permanently fixed biologically to the bone. TADs are particularly useful for distalizing and or intruding molars, which can be a notoriously difficult thing to do without them. So let's talk through some examples of anchorage in premolar extraction cases. So for a maximum anchorage case, this might involve a severe crowding and or incisor protrusion, and those incisors are out too far. And we want to favor the front teeth moving back and keep the anchor teeth where they are. And we don't want those to move very much at all. So not more than a quarter of this extraction space should be closed by the anchor teeth moving forward. In a moderate anchorage case, the anchor teeth can be permitted to move forward about a quarter or a halfway into this extraction space, 
and the same can be said for the front teeth moving back. More or less, this is uh, some reciprocal space closure. And for a minimum anchorage case, the anchorage demand is very low, and the anchor teeth are permitted to move forward into that extraction space. And we often want them to do so, while the front teeth this time, we would prefer not to move back. This often requires some assistance with a skeletal anchors or a taking out second premolars instead of first premolars, because then you're pitting more front teeth, you're reinforcing that front anchorage against a smaller amount of back teeth. So those are just some examples of how we can use anchorage in order to treatment plan our cases. All right, and that's it for this video, guys. Thank you so much for watching. I know it was a lot of technical jargon and terms, but I really hope uh, I was able to simplify it for you so you could understand the basics for your board exam. Please like this video if you enjoyed it and consider subscribing to this channel for more on dentistry. If you're interested in supporting me and what I do here, please check out my Patreon page. A huge thank you to all of my patrons here for all of their ongoing support. You can unlock extras like access to my video slides to take notes on and practice questions for the board exam. So go check that out. The link will be in the description. Thanks again for watching everyone and I'll see you in the next video.